Okay, let's go ahead and begin a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace and for your love for us. We ask for your strength and guidance as we seek to do your will. Father, we pray that you would lead us and guide us in all truth. And I just pray for this ongoing situation that you'd give us wisdom and protection and guidance. I also pray that you give, you, I, we ask that, that your spirit would convict people in authority and leadership to make right decisions. Uh, sometimes it's for our health and sometimes maybe it's, it's um, for, for our freedom. Father God, I pray that they would balance that, but that those decisions would not be on the basis of political and personal gain, Father God, but that they would be honest decisions and right decisions full of justice um, um, before you, Father God. So I ask that you would uh, grant this to, to the leaders that, that are in our lives, whether it's in Asia or the U.S. or in Europe, Father God. And Father, we do ask that you uh, sustain life, that you would um, and this, this COVID crisis that these vaccines would be successful and that there would be, that there would be um, no repercussions or side effects for those that take them. And so we just ask a blessing upon this time now as we study your word. We also pray for ICF as there's a plan for us to open up that you would just bless and, and grant success for mm. all the preparation that you give wisdom to ICF leadership, especially Pastor Noel Father. And so we just, we, we commit this time to you. In Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen. Okay, so um, what I'm going to first do is, if you, if, you, uh, if you can, please turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. So we'll read the text, and then I have a short PowerPoint just to introduce us, and then we'll discuss the text itself. So Revelation chapter 3, we are continuing in our study in Revelation, and so we're on to the... Uh, the church at Sardis, the word of the Lord says, and to the angel of the church of Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You had the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die because I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard, keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I come against you. Yet you have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches." Okay, great. All right. So we're here. All right. So I just, I just want to introduce you. I haven't done this for every church. I apologize for that. I'm trying, I'll try to continue. I'll try to do this for the rest just to really give us a historical context. So one of the, one of the big takeaways that we had at the beginning of this, of this vision was that, um, and at the beginning of this book is that these churches, there's different views on the, the churches in the, in the book of Revelation. Some people say they're not real churches. They're just symbolic of the church age. And that was a, a big uh, push through, through um, church history. But the one thing that we're really emphasizing is that these are historical churches with, a, with an a historical context. In order to understand what's going on, now we can't have, we don't lose meaning if we don't understand this, but we'll, we have a better, we can have a better understanding of what's going on in the text if we, if we have a view of the historical and contextual background. So that's not to say that the text is deficient without considering the historical contextual background, but we should be, um, we should, that should be a factor in our interpretation. Okay, so I don't want to take away from the, the authority of the text. At the same time, I do think that this does illuminate the text a little more, it gives us a little more understanding into the original context, and that helps us to apply it in our day. So just some quick truths and, and statements about the historical and contextual background of the city of Sardis and then also the church itself. So Sardis was a city of the Roman province of Asia. The city was destroyed by an earthquake in 17 AD. So this is a church in, in, in Asia Minor. We'll have a, a picture in, in a moment where that is on the map. It was destroyed by, by a great earthquake, but the emperor Tiberius rebuilt it. So uh, you can imagine the the debt of gratitude that the Sardis 
citizens had. And so in response, they built a temple honoring him. This also led to a lot of uh, emperor worship in the, in the first and second, third centuries. And um, in connection with this, they, they also have existing gods. Uh, the patron deity Sybil was the Anatolian mother goddess. So this is, now I couldn't distinguish if Sybil was different than Artemis or Artemis is just the local name of Sybil in Ephesus because they're both mother goddess. I don't know if you can see that points number four and five. They both are described as mother goddess. So the patron deity Sybil of Sardis seems to be the simil similar or the same as Artemis the patron deity of Ephesus, they're both considered mother goddess, or I guess they could be different ones depending on the city. I couldn't, I couldn't determine if they were the same or not in my research. I did not research it thoroughly. So, so perhaps there is that answer if you, if you do your own research. Um, needless to say, these are both um, goddesses dealing with fertility and, and success and blessing. And so this would have had a significant impact and temptation for those in the church to be practicing the, the pagan um, religion for their benefit, both of their families and also their businesses. So there's a huge take, there's a huge incentive to be idolatrous and to follow other gods, um, not just for their personal benefit, but also for social benefit. So this, is, this, is, this, also, adds, this also adds a context as to why I think we're gonna see um, Jesus has some very strong words for the church of Sardis. And I, and I think that this does help the context as to why it, 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 the, the wording is so strong. And, and, and we'll see that. Uh, just a map, I have a map here. So you can see all the seven churches. Maybe I'll keep sharing this each week. So if you can see here, all the churches are very close together. Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Smyrna, Ephesus, Laodicea. They're all really close together. Yeah, we can't, we can't speak to other churches, why they weren't included. Colossae, you can see there, they were, it was not included. N nonetheless, uh, th these, are, these are the seven major churches of Asia by the, 90, by the 90s in the first, the first century. Just a couple pictures for us. So this is the remains of a synagogue, fourth, uh, fourth century AD. So this would not be the, the first century, but it would definitely give you a context. You have a... Um, what the synagogue would look like. In some ways, it looks very similar to our setup of our churches, right? There's an altar in the front, probably where the person would, would read the Torah and they would have teaching. And, and then there's, uh, looks like pillars on the side, but it's an open room, very similar to how our churches are set up. So just really interesting seeing that picture. Uh, this is the temple of Artemis. So Artemis is in Sardis. That's why I'm thinking that Sybil might be the same name. I, I couldn't determine if it was different, but there's this temple of Artemis. And the crazy thing is that um, this is, so this is, a, this is the picture of what the temple, very large. If you can see a person on the bottom left, you can see how big the temple was and how big those pillars are. They're, they're absolutely ginormous. Obviously at one point it had a roof and now it's gone. But if you look here in the third and fourth century, um, there's a church, you can see the church. <laughs> They built the church right next to the, to the temple, probably after the temple was destroyed or was no longer in effect. They built a church right next to the temple. Um, and I just, I, I, I think about the, the words of, of Jesus in Matthew 16, where the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. And it's just so interesting that they built a church right next to the temple. <laughs> so crazy. And then you have also the, uh, the internal picture of the of the church, and again, you you can see clearly it's a it's a room that's facing the, towards the front where you would have someone speaking or, or teaching. What are your comments? Let's look first at verse verses verse chapter three verse one. And so I, I hope that by now we are really seeing a pattern in in Jesus's words to the church. So so what do we have? What are some observations, some actions, some objects? Who is the actor? What are the statements? What is different than the previous ones? What is similar? So we have a lot of things we can go to. Well, the statement is directed again to the angel or the yeah, messenger. So, yeah, so it's really, it's really the same pattern each time. 
So th the one who's receiving the action is the receiver of the action is the uh, is the angel, and it's always with reference to the church. And so mm -hmm. here you have the church in Sardis, right? So this is with reference to. And we talked about how the angel could be a messenger. So it's not necessarily a literal angel, but it's probably, um, regardless of how we see this, the point is it's going to the pastor and then it's going to the church. That's, that's the goal. So the, the message is to get to the church, to the people in the pew. Is it the first time that mentioned the seven spirits of God, or was it mentioned before? I couldn't. Uh... I think it's. Uh -huh. I think it's been mentioned before. I'm trying to where, reference where? it. Uh... Where? Mm, earlier, I, I don't know. I'm just. Seven wasn't it right stars, at, right, right at the beginning, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. Too. I was thinking about. It. Who, who, someone said it was at the beginning. Who, who said that? Was that was that Sylvia? Where did, no, where, I, where did it, you it was that? me? Yeah. I know the seven stars, but not the seven spirits, if I can find it. I thought we had talked about the fact that those seven spirits represented the one Holy Spirit in the Wasn't that the, at the yeah, beginning? I of yeah, I remember that. We, we discussed about that, but I'm trying just to find the, the passage. that. Chapter 1, verse 4 should be. The introduction oh, yeah. to the book. The introduction. Yeah, oh, yeah. there you go. There you go. I saw it. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. No problem. No problem. And and so what's significant is that this vision is going even back to the, it's going beyond the vision back to the beginning. So what I, what I really want us to see is that when we read Revelation 1, 1 through 1, I believe it's 20. Yeah, 1 to 20. Th this is the guiding... This is the guide. The rest of the book. So this is the rest of Revelation. So you're going to have these statements continuing to come back again and again and again. So we have to have this in one way. We have to have this, this pattern thinking about thinking about the concepts, the constructs in, 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 in this part as going throughout Revelation. So we have the Holy Spirit, and then we also have the seven churches, right? So this is the seven stars are, this is the, 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 the seven stars are not the seven churches, but the seven messengers, right? And, and notice here, since you may highlight this, this is possession. So who, who is in control of these the seven spirits and the seven messengers who is the one over them who has possession of them who has control of them more specific jesus. than god though jesus 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 so we see that what we can say here again is jesus is sovereign over his church okay and so when i say sovereign sovereign just means it, the authority sovereign refers to kingship so that's what we need to be really identifying here that what jesus is is telling the angel of the church of sardis the words that you're recording here the words that you're sending so this is the second portion of the object those words are the words of of Jesus. They're Jesus's words, and Jesus is the one who is sovereign over his church. So if ever there is words that there has, they have to listen to, it's these words. And again, they're writing the words down. And I just think it's so significant that it's not an oral message. It's not an oral message, but a written message. And if something is written, it can't be changed, right? We can, we can change an oral message. We can corrupt an oral message. It's much harder to, to corrupt a written message. There is something to be said as to why our Bible is written and not just oral stories that are passed down. It is something to be said of why we are a written culture and how that writing something down protects the message itself. Again, he refer, he says he knows, right? He, he, know, he, he knows. This is a... Um, 
a knowledge statement, right? And what he knows is their works. Well, so we have number one, the big thing is that he has this knowledge statement. Uh, what else do we see here? That the church is a lively church. Uh, can we say outward? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so no, so, so it's, it, there is this reputation of being alive. So I think a, 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 a big thing here is an outward, outward uh -huh. appearance of life. Yeah, I guess I guess I meant it in quotations, you know, lively. Oh, oh I, that, that's why, uh, uh, Luigi, that's why I'm so irritated with I can't see your face because I would have picked up on that. So I apologize. Gotcha. But so there's this outward appearance. But in reality, what's the reality? Even though there's this outward appearance, what's the reality, Luigi? Finish They're the spiritually finish. dead. Yes, excellent. So this is the this is the actual state. This is the real state. And so the reality is, is that they are dead. And we can say this, yes, we can use that, that symbolism because like they're physically alive, but they're spiritually dead. It's not, it's not a literal deadness. It's a spiritual death, Spirit, spiritually dead. Everyone see that? I was wondering that there's no, that they're dead. I'm telling you, they, 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 they don't. How can we know that they don't, Noel? What, Pastor Noel, what would tell us that they don't know what's going on? What's the clue in, on, the, on the board, if you can see the clue? Because they have found their works are not complete. Yeah, but, but what, what's, what's the specific statement that tells us that they're not, they're not self-aware the of their condition? Yeah, okay, yeah, I, yeah that their reputation, other people, but I'm saying, what's the clue that, that they don't understand what's going on? There's a statement. If you're not awake, you're <laughs> asleep. <laughs> asleep. They're not yet self-aware. Yeah. There, there. This is a this is a command here. This is a command. There, this here is telling the, us that they're not self-aware of their condition. Does everyone see that's, that? Mm -hmm. That's really dangerous, though. I mean, I wonder. So dangerous. How many churches today are like, uh, they seem to be alive. They have the reputation, you know? I mean, when you say they have a reputation, meaning they may be the people in the neighborhood or their testimony is good, but God knows more than, you know? Yeah. They may be, a, they, they may be alive and big and maybe mega, yeah. but they're dead wow no it's That's... really true yeah i agree with I mean, you i mean what how can how can they how can we know how can yeah i think that's so profound and i think that there's so much truth in that and it's scary it's really scary because they're not they're not self-aware and 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 their inward condition this is their inward condition it's scary and so you know they say uh Recognition is the first step to recovery, right? Recognition, awareness. If, if we're not aware of our own sin condition, there's no way that we can repent. There's no way that we can have true revival. That's true. And so, and so I really think that there is something so deep and so true that genuine repentance. So let's, let's, just, let's just define here. Genuine repentance reveals first real self-awareness to one's condition. And so this is the thing. Repentance, repentance is not confession. Repentance does not equal confession. So this is something that we need to consider in our own lives as a church. When we're dealing with sin, people will often, when someone confesses sin, they think that, oh, when I confess sin, that signifies repentance. 
but repentance repentance is fundamentally a heart change the outward the the true these two are not equal confession is the result of the inward this is outward this is outward this is inward so when you're dealing with sin in your life in your own in, in someone you know maybe it's in your children they can confess all they want but if there isn't if there um, um, if there isn't a true heart change you can tell when the confession isn't real <laughs> you can tell when it's it's fake and so what I want us to see here is that we have to have a, a, a genuine self-awareness to our own sin uh, condition and state. And here the church does not have it yet. They're not there yet. Confession is agreeing with God that what you did was wrong. Yeah. And then, because you agree with God, repentance is like a, a change of heart on that, on that, on that sin that you have committed, you know, it's like a, yeah, a change of heart, meaning you will, you will not because you know that it's wrong, you change your heart and not do it again. Yeah, it's like you're crossing the bridge and then you're burning the bridge so you don't cross back. Yeah, so I like the, I really like that, Pastor Noel, changing of one's heart, one's no, I like I like that description, one's heart, or we could say mind, depending mind. Mm -hmm. But, but I do think, to clarify, because the, the changing of the mind is so that you can cross the bridge. <laughs> I think, I, so I, 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 because if there isn't that change of mind, can you really agree with God? I guess that's my question. So if you haven't yet changed your mind, you're still not agreeing with God that what you're doing is wrong. But I really like what you're saying that, th this is really clarifying further, Pastor, what, what we're talking about here and here. Um, because someone can confess, but they don't agree with God that what they did was really wrong. You know what I'm saying? So I like, I like, I like this as well. But, but, but I think it, it, it goes beyond just knowledge change and attitudinal change. There has to be a behavioral component of re repentance, yeah. yeah. Meaning, at, at the knowledge level, you know that you did wrong. At the attitude level, you say, "Well, I'm not gonna do that again." But it cannot be. Um, it cannot stop at that. There has to be a behavioral consequence of that of that decision. So you're no. not gonna do it again. Yeah. So. I like what we're seeing here. I like what we're adding. Thank you, Raul. This is so good. So there's this heart, word, and deed. So in all, in all, in all repentance and confession, when you're dealing with sin, I like what I really like what what Kuya Raul is saying that there's the end result of this true repentance is this change in behavior. So this is the outward. This is the outward. This is the outward talaga. Because even someone can, someone can even make a, a, a word claim, but there is, but there's no heart change and there's no behavior change. They're just, this is just, uh, let's just say lip service, lip service. You know, they have to say what they have to say to get off the hook, but there's no heart change and there's no behavior. And in, in, and in reality, this is not real either. Okay. So I want us to see that. This is not genuine, but I, I like what you're saying, Kuya Raul. So coming back to the text now, what do we have here? We have this wake up self-awareness, and then this would, be, this, would be, this would be another command, but this is also behavioral, right? This is outward, strengthen. And this is so beautiful here, because look here, we have this heart word and deed here. Apply it to this. Let's apply it now to this. To this context because people will maybe use this passage here to, to, to have a works-based salvation but looking here it's the works that are not complete the repentance is moving towards this is the goal and the one who is assessing the assessor the judge 
is Jesus. He's the one that's assessing the works. Because at the end of the day, repentance and repentance is, this is the end goal here. Everyone should see this. So I really like what Raul is saying. This is the end goal for repentance. Um, and so Jesus is not looking at, oh, you repented. Oh, you, you, you confessed what was right. No, Jesus, the end goal for Jesus, the, the, the judge will, is going to look at the finished product. He's going to be looking at that. And, and we've talked about this before in the sight of God. This is a reference to judgment. So they're not really totally dead because there is something there is something that remains to be strengthened, which is about to die. Yeah. So they still have a chance <laughs> in a, in a they're, sense. They're, you know? they're at they're at a crossroads. They're at a crossroads. Yeah, they're they're like at the uh, at the edge of the cliff. No, that's really good. And here's the thing. This is a restatement now. Remember. So remember is almost the same as wake up. So this is very similar. Like someone who has forgotten, someone who is asleep. So this is this is we could say here. This is a this is again a, a command, and this could be a restatement uh, for emphasis. He's really calling them to account. Remember what you have received and heard. So this is the content. And there to, there to again, keep it and repent. So this is, per, uh, this is um, saturating. How can I say this? Saturating the context. If they cannot repent genuinely, if they cannot wake up, if they cannot remember, Sayang Talagad, this is the starting point. That's the starting point for them. So the reason why maybe their works are not complete because they are, they are working not according to what they heard and received. Yeah, no, it's good. That's really good. So look here. How about this? Let's come back here. What's their fundamental problem? What I want to argue their fundamental problem is what pastor's saying is that they're focusing on the outward, not the spiritual. I agree with that because of the word reputation. Ha, ah, yes. That, that is the that, big. I think, I think that's what happens if the church will just think about their reputation, their reputation to the community other than their reputation to God, then that's where the problem starts. But here's the crazy thing. The craziest thing is that they have this reputation, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter about the reputation because it's the one who knows <laughs> that matters. So there's only exactly. one opinion that matters. <laughs> that's true. Exactly. That's true. That's why. That's why. That's why the word "no" is very, in, in itself, is very profound. It's not just knowledge in terms of knowing facts or numbers, yeah. but it's more insightful. It goes beyond just. It's probably more knowing as opposed to knowledge. Yes. No. So. So. And I like what you're saying, Raul. And at the end of the day, the word knowledge is somewhat of a. It's, it's a, we, how can I say it? It's a category that we have. So when I write the word knowledge down, I'm not saying that it's just a general knowledge about facts. And I like what you're saying, because this is really a insightful, internal, a true, a true knowing. Let me write this down here. Right. Um, and that speaks of the deity of, of God. Yes. Yes. True knowing, true, genuine knowing. And this would be both facts and heart he knows right. their heart and motives so right. you're a hundred percent correct that so when i use the word knowledge and maybe this is just deficient but i'm trying to help us to think in categories what is this big idea and so it's the big idea what type of actions going on and so it, this is a a knowledge in a in a uh in a in a just a categorical sense trying to quantify how do we describe the sentence okay but but I really like what you're saying that when we're getting down to the heart of it, it's so much more than just, it includes facts. It includes, because he has to know their works. He has to know what they're actually doing to assess them, but it's much more than that. It's, 
not just those outward facts, it's that insightful that insightfulness that you're sharing. It's the heart. And even in the heart, it's the motives. No one can truly know someone's motive, right? We can, we can look at outward facts and we can make an assessment, but in the heart of heart, it's only God. And so I like this clarification here. So let's include this clarification here. Yeah, just one other thing I was thinking about, would this connect to when he's talking about the reputation? It's almost as like when he says, um, you, you've already received your reward. If you, if, you no. do something, if you do something for the pleasing people, you've received your reward. Like you have, yeah. You're not going to receive the reward from, from God, your father, yeah. right? Yeah, so right. this would be, this is an, that is an, a, a phenomenal cross-reference. So Matthew chapter 6, verses 1. Ah, I'm going to mess this up. 1 and following. This climax is in the Lord's Prayer. But there's this, there's this pleasing of man versus pleasing of God. And that's what you're talking about. Um, that's, that's, you can go deeper in the study on your own, um, but that would be an excellent cross-reference. Thank you, Silvio. That is, that is phenomenal. That's a phenomenal statement, uh, connection, I should say. Phenomenal connection. I, I, think it's, I think it's outward versus inward. And there's many passages. It's not just that. You think of David. God, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. So there's, there's, this is a biblical theme. This is a biblical theme. It's also a theological truth. So we're, we're talking about eternal statements that are true concerning God, concerning God's uh, will and desire for mankind. That's what we, when we're saying theology, uh, this is a theological truth that is eternal. That is that God looks beyond our outward and into our heart. And when we look at anthropology, the study of man, man is always looking at the outward because that's all we can see. We're physical, right? We're, we're, we cannot look beyond the outward. We can make assessments upon the inward, but at the end of the day, we are, we are physical finite beings. Only God is infinite and can look beyond the physical in the, in, into the heart, into the soul, into the spirit. Excellent. That's a judge. Judge is the only one who's qualified to judge anyone. Yeah. So judge. That's the, that's this theme of judge. And I think that we're going to see this theme throughout Revelation. This idea that Jesus and God are, uh, they are the judge. They are the judge and they're, they're bringing their creation, their created beings to account. And the judgment is beginning with the church before it moves to the world. That, that is a big idea of revelation to be thinking about. And you're seeing it played out here. Um, excellent. Okay. Anyone else want to, let's move on here. We're running out of time. Let's move on here. Another let's, thing, I, think I just yeah, want to make one more, yeah. one more point. I think uh, what, what reminds me here is like, we have a tendency to forget. All of us have a tendency to forget and a tendency to sleep. So I think this is a reminder, you know, we should never forget. We should always remember what we have received and what we have heard. You know, don't, and don't, don't uh, shy away from those. No, that's so profound, Pastor. And I think that that, that is, we have to be on so much on guard. We are in a spiritual warfare until Christ returns, until we receive our glorified bodies. And for us to, we have maybe a big spiritual success. And then our tendency is just to relax. Let's use that word. I like that word, relax. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. That's a good Chill. <laughs> Chill. Yeah, that's Chill. right. Chill. <laughs> sit, sit on your lazy boy. <laughs> oh my goodness oh my goodness so that's really good excellent observations today i'm really enjoying this uh, okay let's go down here okay so um what is the warning here what is the warning here now if they don't repent what's going to happen so there's there's this warning here that god is going that jesus is going to come against them yeah, I think he's saying, I'm going to come, and how do you want me to come? You want me to come for you or come like a thief? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is, a, this is a conditional statement here. 
And this is, it, this is the, the condition is it that if you don't wake up, I'm going to come, right? And, and, and <laughs> Jesus knows all, you won't know when I come. <laughs> you see the word like, you will not know the hour that I will come against you. Um, and this is really scary here. This is, this is in judgment, in opposition. It, the, the, the comparison is, is, we could say comparison or maybe manner is better. Manner. The manner in which Jesus will come is like a thief. No one knows when the thief comes. No one knows yeah, when the, the thief comes. The, the thief doesn't make an appointment to your house. No. <laughs> no. And, 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 and this, this, comes back to, this comes back to the point of that we have to live. We have to live. This is, this is similar to what Noel was saying about living uh, vigilantly. Living on guard. That's acceptable. That's acceptable. <laughs> on guard. Now look down here, verse four. This, this really, so here he's coming against you, and the you is the church. It's, 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 a, it's, it's in the singular. So it's probably referring to the church. The church is also singular. So here, the church is also singular up here. So that's the connection. Singular and singular. This is also singular. But this, this is not a corporate punishment. So the, the, the righteous will not suffer with the unrighteous. And so this, this assures us that God is, that Jesus is fair, that not everyone is corrupt. And look, look at this. I still have a few names in Sarda, people who have not soiled their garments. So this, this refer, how can we describe, how can we describe this? What's a way for us to describe soil, soiled? What's one or two words? People who have not soiled their garments. What's another way of saying that? Christianese terminology. Stained with sin. Okay, stained with sin. So we can say stained with sin. Uh, what's a positive way of saying um, uh, not stained with sin? What's a positive way that we can say this? If you're not stained, you are... Pure. What? Faithful? Stained. Yeah, pure. I like that word pure. And of course, we could use the word faithful. That's, that's, that's good as well. But looking at, looking at this holy. phrase, yeah, pure or holy is really the best idea, I, I think. Who said pure? Who was that? Who was that masked woman? Your wife. I know. I, I, that's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> Call out call out and look at this think about this those who fight to keep themselves pure and holy in this life look at what the promise is look at the promise here the promise is that they will walk with me in white what is another word for what is another idea for this here now walk with me in white We've talked about this before. Maybe, maybe the connection I'm asking too much. But um, thinking about the biblical theological perspective, going back to Genesis, we had, we had, we, we had uh, sermons in Genesis. What's the big statement here? What's the description here? In Genesis, what does God do with man? That's really significant. So this is in many ways a fulfillment. If someone is obeying God, they are... Okay, yes, but, but I'm, I'm thinking uh, walking with God, right? We talk about that man walk with God. So we, we, we see Enoch walking with God. This is referring to divine presence is what I'm trying to get at. Divine presence, the presence of God. And so this is literal. One day we will literally walk with Jesus. Maybe that's not so profound. 
maybe it's not for me just thinking about we're doing a study in biblical theology and just seeing how God's presence left man because of his sin throughout Genesis and yet here there's this promise that the judge of the universe will walk with people so maybe that's more profound in, in cultures where we are divided by class and so the king of the universe will walk with us king judge of universe i i don't know if that's resonating with you maybe for me it's it's it, it's in a new way what i'm thinking about here is condescension None of us, in, in, in the ultimate sense, none of us are worthy, okay? So none of us are worthy. We are only in the presence of God by God's grace. At the same time, those who are generally brought in by justification, we have to always be coming back to this paradigm. I, I want us to see this, okay? This is the paradigm in Scripture, okay? So when, when one thing is accented, it implies the rest. Is everyone tracking there with me? So, so here, the focus is on, the focus here is on the outward, but it presupposes the inward. Everyone tracking there with me. It, this is so fundamental. So sometimes it'll just reference the outward, okay, in scripture. It'll just reference the works, but the inward is presupposed. And we see that here, reputation of being alive, but are dead. And so the opposite could be true. Maybe you have a bad reputation outwardly, but inwardly you're alive, okay? Because, the, because God doesn't care about the opinions of man. The world is going to be forever against us, all right? So here, this is not a works-based salvation, but a, but a reality of, of this process that has happened in their lives, a heart change, a change in your words, and then an, a change in your action, in your behavior, okay? I want everyone to see that, okay? The, the, whenever you read scripture, you have to have this paradigm in your mind. I would just write it down, take the picture, um, and just, uh, just, just hardwire it into your thinking that when you see this statement, the rest are implied, okay? Or if you just see this statement, the others are implied as well, okay? You can, when you're looking at a structure, when you're looking at a structure, okay? Let's just say a house, all right? This is a, such a weak diagram, okay? This is, a, this is a house. You can talk about the roof. If we just talk about the roof, a house is implied. If we just talk about the foundation, a house or a building is implied. If we talk about windows, um, I, you, I have nice windows in my house, or you can just say, Do you, I have nice windows. Well, Tim doesn't have a house. I don't know if Tim has a house. No, well, obviously if I'm talking about my windows, I have to have a house. So does everyone understand what I'm trying to say here? Is that, is that, tr are you tracking with me here? What I'm trying to say is that, uh, you can, you can look at walls as well, is that whether we focus on one aspect, the whole concept of, the whole concept of a building or a house is being implied, okay? The same thing is true in the spiritual life. We can accent one idea, word, or heart, but the rest are being implied, okay? So when you come back here, they walk with me in white for they are worthy. The worthy is accenting their good works, okay? But this is not a works-based salvation. This is just focusing upon the outward. Is everyone tracking there with me? Okay, lastly, lastly. So this is one promise here. We have two more promises, uh, more than two more promises. We have three more promises. So these are, these are this is promise number one. Promise number... Two, promise number 
three, and promise number four. Number one, the one who conquers will be clothed in white garments. What are some other statements that we've seen in the past? Can anyone give other promises from the earlier context? You mean from the past, the, from the past churches, or like yeah, from the past churches, from name, the past churches, right? Right, his like name the white on the, stone? Like the columns. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so no, that's good. So we have we have the 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 white stone, white stone, with the name, with the new name. Um, what else do we have? Pastor Noel, what did you say? Oh, that's one of the white stones is what I was yeah. thinking. And then also the, the fruit of the tree of life. Uh, not hurt by the second death. Authority right. over nations. Yeah, authority, 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 uh, um, authority over nations. Anything else? I think there might be one more. Maybe not. Maybe that was it. I think maybe we got them all. What about the mana? Yeah, the hidden mana. That's what it was, hidden mana. So what I want us to see here is that this is not like, okay, only in this church, this is why it's so important for us to be thinking about. It's not like Jesus is like, oh, uh, those people that are faithful in Sardis, they get the white garments, but they don't get the tree of life. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Like, this is not a, a situation where God is, Jesus is divvying up different rewards here. And, and some people get certain rewards, others don't get others. And, and you, you kind of lose out. It's like, okay, you kind of lose, you kind of lose it. You're, you're, you'll be walking around naked. You get, the, you get the fruit from the tree of life, those in Ephesus, but you don't get the white garments. Okay, uh, the, church in, uh, the church in Smyrna, you're not going to be hurt by the second death. But you could have you could have your name blotted out of the book of life. That that could that could happen. You, you, does everyone is everyone tracking with me? So what you're saying is is has has Jesus divvied them up just to kind of give each a uh, taste of what what will what they will get? It's not Ex that you'll only get that, right? Exactly. Okay. Ding 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 ding. You have we have a winner here. So what I'm trying to to see is that it's not that you're going to get one thing and not the other. It's that those who truly conquer, you're going to get all of these things. But, but each, um, how can I say it? it's for like a literary, uh, not, I don't want to say literary effect because Jesus is speaking, but it's for effect. Um, it, it would, it would, it would kind of be, you know, if, if I'm speaking and I just, okay, repeat the exact same thing to the next church and repeat the exact same thing to the, to the next church. Okay. It's, it's not written like that. So we should not think about these as just specific rewards, but in reality, we are all going to receive all of these rewards. And it's just for, I, this is such a, 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 uh, a deficient way of saying it, but it's the way this is written is in some ways it's for a, liter, a, a literary effect. It's a literary device. Okay. Is everyone tracking there with me? Could you say that it's possibly specific to what he's saying per church, that it, it may relate to something that, that they're doing incorrectly or <laughs> yeah so 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 for example so for example so for example yeah so no no that's good that's that's a that's a very good and that's what it is so for example it's not that jesus is just we talked about here that this is just accenting certain things for their context and so in the same way that's actually a better way of saying it remove the literary device i don't want to say that because it's making it sound like john's creating this let's just say this Jesus is, and I'm going with what Luigi said, so I really like what Luigi's saying. What, what we want to say is Jesus is accenting, accenting specific rewards as a motivation. There is a motivation aspect here. So it's not that others are not going to get these rewards. He's accenting specific rewards that would be a motivation to them. So perhaps there was a historical context where people walked around in white garments and they weren't dirty and, and, and maybe they, they wanted, you know, whatever it is, Jesus is accenting certain things to, um, for the sake of that church, but we're all going to receive this. Okay. All of us will never have our names written out of the book of life. 
For all of us, Jesus will confess his name before the heavenly father and his angels. And we know that because, because this is true in, in Matthew chapter 10. This is for all Christians. So that's one proof as to how we know that it's not just for a specific context. This is a restatement from Jesus's teaching. And of course, it, it makes sense because Jesus is the same speaker. Okay, everyone tracking there with. Me. So what I want us to see here is that all of these rewards should, we should be thinking about as receiving. The same thing for here, especially for here. Here, all of us. What I'm trying to get at is this. Some, some, there are some doctrines, there are some theologies in our evangelicalism that will say that only those martyrs will reign. Only those martyrs will reign. Only those, those who suffer or they're, they're faithful in this way, they receive this special reward. So really they're saying that these are specific rewards for specific people, but not all of us receive it. And I'm saying that's a bad interpretation. It's incorrect. Okay, I want us to correct that idea. Is everyone tracking there with me? Okay, we're going to end on this. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And I'm going to repeat this. Blessed are the ones who, who read and those who hear and obey. And so our job is not to judge other churches. Our job is not to judge other people. Our job is to look at this and say, is any of this true? Are there sins in my life that I am un, that, that I'm sleeping to, that I'm I am allowing, I am, I am ignoring? Am I am I the one that needs to wake up? Okay. I'm not saying you are, I'm saying we need to assess ourselves. In this, does this in any way refer to our own life? Are, is, are, our, are our garments soiled? Are we, are we pure and faithful? Are we pure and faithful before God? If not, remember what you have heard and received. Keep it and repent. If not, wake up and strengthen what you have and what remains. So that is the challenge for us today. That is the challenge that Jesus has that ha he had for the church of Sardis. It might not apply to us as a church, us as individuals. It might apply. I, I cannot confirm or deny. What I can say is this. It's never too late. Our call is, our response should always be repent, believe, and then change. Moving from the internal to the outward and ultimately in our behavior as Raul mentioned earlier and so that's with that i will i will close our study i hope it's a benefit to us and um i hope that the the, the I, I hope that we're really seeing how revelation has incredible bearing so far in the church it has an incredible bearing amen application